please uh, join me in welcoming MIT President Raphael Reif. I was going to thank Ananta for that introduction, but it was too short. <laughs> Ananta, I want to thank you for your terrific leadership uh, in bringing this MIT Intelligent Quest to life. Today's uh, speakers and panelists already provided a thrilling preview of the range of questions we hope to explore in the future. So I will limit myself only to a couple of observations. My first observation is that in the history of science and technology, there are moments of opportunity, moments when the tools, the data, and the big questions are perfectly in sync. In the field of intelligence, I believe this is just such a moment. I'm confident that the structure we've created will allow us to seize the full promise of this moment as we contribute to advancing the understanding of intelligence in every sense, and as we use that deep grasp of human intelligence to build wiser and more useful machines for the benefit of humankind. There may be no more important work in this generation. So I thank you, all of you, for joining us this afternoon and this day. My second observation, we would not be here today without the open-hearted help of many people inside and outside MIT. First, to all the faculty members who pour the insights of a lifetime into shaping this effort. Thank you so very much. The momentum you have built is powerful, and I look forward with admiration to seeing what you all will achieve. I also want to recognize three companies whose generosity has made this progress possible. To our great friends at IBM, it was your bold early support that set us on this path. We're truly excited for the work we will do together. To MIT alumnus, Xiao Tang, and your thriving company, Sense Time, we're grateful for the trust you have placed in us in creating the MIT Sense Time Alliance on Artificial Intelligence. And we are inspired by what we can achieve together for the benefit of society. And as the world knows, Google is among the great global forces advancing AI. So it is with humility and gratitude that I announce a wonderful gift from Google, which I will enable a significant number of MIT students to advance their research in human and artificial intelligence. As we begin this new effort, it means a great deal to all of us to have the endorsement of this superb industry leaders, and I thank you all so very much. Finally, we would not be here today without the intellectual investment of two exceptional individuals. David Siegel of Two Sigma Investments and Eric Schmidt of Alphabet. Both David and Eric have been with us on this project from the beginning, helping us to shape the ideas, to hopefully avoid the mistakes, and to raise the bar high. In these early stages, their time, ideas, and wisdom have been essential. So we are thrilled that we will be able to count on their guidance going forward as well, because they have both agreed to serve as founding advisors to the MIT Intelligence Quest. So again, to David and Eric and everyone involved, thank you very much.
It is now my great pleasure to join you in welcoming one of these terrific advisors. With this audience, there is almost nothing I can say to introduce our next guest. The man who, in his 10 years as CEO, helped transform Google from a Silicon Valley startup to a global leader in technology. But I do want to tell you what I am so delighted and why I'm so delighted that Eric Smith has agreed to build new ties with MIT. In addition to his work as a founding advisor for this effort, Eric was recently named an MIT Visiting Innovation Fellow. As the Intelligence Quest seeks to shape transformative new technologies to serve society, I know that Eric's brilliant strategic and tactical insight, organizational creativity, and exceptional technical judgment will continue to be a tremendous asset. And for our students, particularly for our students, his experience in driving some of the most important innovations of our time will serve as an example and an inspiration. We're extremely grateful that Eric is giving us the precious gift of his time. You might think that would be enough, but I'm delighted to report that Eric and Wendy Schmidt have also made a special financial gift that will help support the MIT Intelligence Quest during its first crucial year. Eric, we couldn't be more honored to have you with us and helping us. Please join me on stage. Please welcome Eric Schmidt. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. I just take one of these two. I think I should congratulate you. You were the person who drove this vision. You were the one who said, we have to take advantage of this opportunity that you saw before and look at what you've achieved. It's extraordinary as a start. Oh, you're, you're very kind, Eric. Thank you. Right? Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. So, uh, of the many things that you as president will have done to make this institution better, this may be one of the most important because you're auguring in what I call the age of intelligence, right? And it starts here. It's, it's a little scary to think of the age of intelligence with, with the two of us here on stage. Uh, the but. next generation is smarter than we are, <laughs> trust me. That's a great hope. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. When, when, uh, when, when some of us were thinking about something like this, um, uh, I, I approached Eric and I discussed this concept with him in a very vague way. And, uh, and it was very comforting to me to hear that, that he thought this was worth pursuing. So, so that's, that's why from the very beginning, Eric as well as David has been helping us with this. Eric, I have a, a, I just, let's have a, a, a quick chat about views. I'm gonna talk to Eric for just a few minutes and then I'm gonna open the floor for questions you sent in advance. Uh, so I'm gonna just choose a few of those and, and ask Eric from, from the audience. But uh, what, you know, in your jobs uh, at Alphabet, uh, you, you just know everything that's going on, more or less, at Alphabet and Alphabet Company. So uh, you know how it's, what's possible at, uh, in that environment. What can a place like MIT, or what can academia do? How, how can we help? What, what role do we play? What is that we should do? What, how do we focus all this excitement in something that can actually do contribute in that landscape? Well, as, as you've articulated in the core and bridge strategy, it looks like the technologies invented in the last decade can transform pretty much every aspect of MIT. And one of the things to remember is that these algorithms, at least today, depend on big data, large collections of data. So in our conversations, I've been urging the corporation, if you will, and I'll say this over and over again, is you've got to become a place that is the defining data platform for something. So in a medical area, you have to figure out a way to aggregate that data in a way that you can produce exceptional results. Um, in the case of physics, and in the case of math, and in the case of material science, and in the case of computer science, self-driving, you name it, 
these battles will be won by the best algorithm and the big data strategies. And in many cases, universities are excellent places to collect this data. Universities have lots of data, but it's sitting in corners, right? So you all have an opportunity to get it in a set of places that's access accessible to every student. One of the goals of the Google GIF, which I'm very proud uh, that Google decided to do, is to make it possible that when a, a young student has an idea, he or she has just all that computation is right there in front of them. And hopefully they can go to the data source that's there that is their idea, and they can get access to it, that they don't have to spend five days trying to figure out how to fill out the forms and find it in the vault, right? So what you want to do is you want to enable serendipity among your students, right? Sitting at night, they have a crazy idea, and they can try it. And that's where the great discoveries will come from. It's always been true in universities, and it will be now be true with this data platform that you all are going to build. And, and that is, that is a, a tremendous opportunity, not just for all of us, but particularly for our students, which is, which is where the Google Gift is actually uh, focused on. Uh, what, and, and I should emphasize, by the way, that this was not my first idea. This is how Google works, right? We've got all that data in such a way that when engineers think of a new product, they can access it. They don't have to ask for five permissions. They can try it. They can run a test. They can run a beta test. It's how discovery works in an age of data and intelligence. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at MIT. We're, not, we're close, I would like to think, but we're not there yet. Uh, another topic of interest to you, which is a companion to all this conversation, uh, is, is topics related to the future uh, and, 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 and works and so forth. And people speak in terms of why can we design automation systems or AI kind of systems that, that take into account uh, societal impact and human impact? I mean, is that a conversation or is, it, is that possible? Can we actually think of designing systems and can we actually think of designing them that have uh, a human and societal impact in mind? So one of my, my friends who's a political leader said one day to me, you guys are so smart or you think you're so smart, why can't you build systems that cure some of these problems? And he then talked about inequality, equal opportunity, narrowing rather than increasing the dispersion of incomes, making the world a safer and, if you will, happier place. Right? To me, these are value decisions. And when there's a conflict between a capitalistic goal and a value decision, hopefully you can get them both together. Uh, I hope our company represents those values, that we do our very best to represent the principles. And I can tell you that if we've learned anything under the new administration and in the new weird stuff that's going on in the world, it's that values drive behavior. So I hope when you found your next extraordinary company, you start with a set of values about what you're trying to solve and that you stick to them. Well, the, the issue, and, and you addressed what I was going next, the, the key issue here is if we know how to do that, we should be able to figure out how to educate the future technology leaders to think that way. Yeah. And, and that's a conversation we're having today, how to educate them to think in that fashion. Uh, but mo most computer science programs, by the way, are now beginning to think about build, bringing an ethics uh, into their computer science faculty, literally with professors in computer scientists who are experts on ethics. And that's a, that was actually a shock to me, because I've always thought of computer science in a sort of more narrow way. But almost every interesting problem in computer science now comes with an ethic or moral issue, the most obvious being the bias that is easily slipped into these machine learning systems. Well, that's, that's, exactly where, that's, that's exactly where I think we should be heading right now. We do some of that as well, but not enough. I'm going to move into, into the audience, but before I go there, I'm going to ask you a question that I was asked several times, but not by people who submitted that question in advance. And that's more a quasi-personal question. The, the question is, Eric, if you were an undergraduate today, what would you major in? Well, it's interesting that, that um, you've given me that opportunity because you made, I'm very, very proud of being associated with you all as an innovation fellow. And so I get to answer that question for real. And my generic answer has been in healthcare. And my specific answer is in machine learning and AI at the computational level for thinking. The reason my general answer is healthcare is that no matter how good you are, there's going to be gazillion jobs in healthcare 
in these new areas. The ability to use these tools to take heretofore bespoke algorithms, right, and turn them into reproducible, efficient, more positive, more life-friendly outcomes, is, it's a scale that's incomprehensible. Plus, the good fact that human society in general is getting older means there's more customers. So you've got more <laughs> customers, you've got better algorithms, you've got a, a financial incentive, you have perfect alignment in healthcare. And indeed, MIT has a great deal of efforts in this area that you've already heard, and you need more. And I suspect that in the bridge, you're going to see a lot of activity That's there. Right. Right. Most of the AI startups that I talk with are using classical learning on specific medical problems because they can get the money <laughs> and they can get the results quickly enough. Uh, there's, and as an aside, in medicine, we know that we can mimic the existing systems. There are many people who believe that with additional instrumentation, additional monitoring, we can actually detect diseases earlier, which is, of course, the holy grail. And a long-term goal, right, in healthcare is to end up with physician's assistants that are largely voice-based that can actually sort of help the physician do the deep learning and deep analysis while the physician is chatting with the patient. Mm -hmm. We think this is achievable. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and I, then the specifics in machine learning is that we are just at the beginning of the science of deep learning as we know it today. And five or 10 years from now, we'll be talking about uh, completely new algorithms, which will have been discovered, among other things, by the work at CORE. There are quite a few students in the audience paying attention to exactly everything you just said about how you would have done things. Let me move to, uh, to, to your question. Let me just say we received many questions in advance for, for Eric, and we kind of boxed them in different pockets. So I have uh, samples of each of those buckets to ask, to ask Eric. So let me start with, with the first one I can find here. Uh, who will be the regulators of AI in society? So there will be regulators, but my view on regulation is that it should always be later than you want because early regulation really does stifle creativity. And what happens with a regulator is because they are sort of an arbitrary decision maker, they set the goalposts and the signposts for the industrial structure. Once the regulator sets that structure, all of the incentives are such to keep it exactly the way it is. Hmm. It's very important that regulation occur later, not earlier. And I love this conversation. We should regulate AI. Like, for what, right? <laughs> you're, you're talking about regulating robots that you've seen in a movie. Well, we haven't built those yet. And frankly, what's in the movies today is probably not what we're going to end up building. Maybe it'll be better or maybe it'll be worse, but it's not going to be what you see today. But we all have a sense when early is. But when, when is, when, how do we have a sense of when is the right time? So instead of spending all day worrying, why don't you wait until there's an actual near miss, right? One of the things that's happened, right, is that everything in society is actually going better in general. Life extension is much longer, literacy is much better. Look at the quality of the students today here at MIT. They're extraordinarily better than my generation. I'm sorry for those of you who are my age, but it's just true, right? <laughs> There's all sorts of reasons why things are better globally, global growth, uh, healthcare, blah, 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 and yet we're all more depressed, right? It's because we're a nation of worriers, right? And so let's not translate that worry into premature constraints on the innovators here in the room. Um, I, we can sense that if you're about to innovate something that's going to really harm people, there'll be lots of people looking at you. Thank you. Let me go to the next one. What countries are leading the AI race and why? Well, today, I mean, the history here, the most recent stuff was done by uh, Canada and the United, Can Canadian and United States companies. The people who did a lot of that work ended up being hired by many of the companies, including Google, to sort of start this off. So it was university driven, great then acquired by some of the leading tech companies um, in the United States and China. There are now groups within in Israel and in Europe and so forth that are trying to catch up. But so far, the majority of the effort is in the United States and in China. And in case you're sitting there thinking, things are going really well here at MIT, we have a good life, it's a great community, so forth, the weather's nice today, all that kind of stuff, um, China has announced its plan that by 2020, it'll be your equal and by 2030, it will globally dominate in the age of intelligence. And as you know, China has five times more people. The people are incredibly intelligent. Do not dismiss the competitive threat, the opportunity for partnership. One of the questions that you're going to have to think about, um, and you don't have to answer this right now, obviously, 
is how do you want to work with this emergent Chinese extraordinary achievements, right? Um, my personal view is that this research, that all the things we're doing, needs to be done in the open, right, for all sorts of reasons. But if it's done in the open, it also means that near competitors, which today China is, will quickly be your equal. Eric, what, when you say, what is in China, particularly in some universities and even some laboratories, the government is investing heavily. Yeah. Uh, Wouldn't it be nice if our government invested in our universities? <laughs> he said it. Look, can I just, I just want to show, there are many, many stupid things going on, but preventing intelligent, educated foreigners to come to MIT, that's really stupid. And another really stupid thing is to cut down our funding of basic research in the universities. The universities and the education created the industries that we're talking about. I am directly a recipient of NSF, DARPA, and in my case, uh, Berkeley and Princeton, funding that came out of the federal government. I was too young to understand what they were doing. I am incredibly grateful now. You're gonna shut that stuff down? What kind of idiots are you? So I have an opinion. Uh, Eric, I may, I may ask your permission to take that video and promote it, except for the last sentence. I wanna just- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got a little too excited there. <laughs> Next question, um, what advice are you offering world leaders to help ensure technological innovation is a vehicle to advance social inclusion instead of making social and income inequalities worse? My personal view is that there's a very great danger of increasing inequality in the age of intelligence. And it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, many of these industries have network effects and they tend to have single winners or a small number of winners, and then the impact scales broadly. So it's probable that the places that innovate in this area, hopefully Cambridge, Boston, MIT, the Bay Area, perhaps Beijing and Shanghai, we'll see, probably, um, will end up get with a disproportionate share of the economic returns from these inventions. So the first answer is, don't do stupid stuff, right? Open up your borders, let the smartest people come to your country. I worry, for example, in the UK that the Brexit maneuver um, could have the effect of taking some of the Europeans that would like to move to, to London, uh, which is a hub for these things, and convince them not to come. That's a loss for Britain, right? So we're in a global economy of globally competitive uh, smart people. So you want to have, and I'd say this over and over again, you want your unfair share of the kind of people who can shape this future. The second thing is that many, many countries outside the United States and China are underfunding their universities. Everyone talks about, hey, I want to have another Silicon Valley. That's great. Then you better start by funding the research, um, helping the graduate students, providing the support, all the things that, that were invented by Vannevar Bush and others in the 40s and 50s, which I and all of us in the room were recipients of. And then I think the third issue is that for countries which are not going to lead here, they're going to have to find niche, right? In the sense that they're going to have to be excellent at something. Mm -hmm. And if you can't articulate what that is, then you're not really being a very good leader. And I try not to say that too bluntly to the presidents of these countries. Uh, but you're gonna to have to find a way to lead in the age of intelligence where your unique human resource is really adding value because it's a global competitive market. And we're not gonna go back you're not going to turn the forces of globalization back. You're not going to shut down all those fiber links between the oceans. It's not going to happen. Well, let me see. Uh, th that sounds like very sound advice for world leaders. L let me move about American universities and see whether, what kind of advice do you give to us? Uh, the question that comes next is, are there ways for our most elite institutions to apply their combined strengths to advance society? How can they better collaborate to expand their access and impact to far more of society? Well, universities traditionally have stovepipe uh, problems. You know, the way departments are organized, they don't tend to talk to each other. All the leading universities that I've spoken with have initiatives such as the ones you have pioneered to try to get the uh, various disciplines to talk to each other to make great advances. That should continue and it needs a lot more effort. And that pressure has to come from the top because the, the departments themselves won't naturally merge. It has to come from leaders like yourself. The second point, which I meant earlier, is that this is the age of collaboration around data and research data among universities. You're gonna be far stronger if you're looking at a cancer problem. 
if you collaborate with the top hospitals in this area, but what about around the country? What about the best cancer research group in another university that's not in Boston, Cambridge? And when I say collaborate, that doesn't mean you have to jointly you know, uh, have faculty. It just means you have to exchange your data in a way that both can benefit from machine learning. So a, a simple rule of break down the stovepipe barriers, which you're already doing, and then seek to build large collections of data that's useful for research. That's with permission, HIPAA compliant, all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about violating any rules there. Doing it in a proper way, but doing it quickly will engage and accelerate the research institution. Mm -hmm. A lot to think about there in those comments. This is a, a more parochial question that, I, uh, uh, that is listed here to ask you. What advantages does MIT have over others in doing AI? 990 students in your AI program. How many students do you have total? A few thousand, right? So you're producing them, right? I'm concerned that you're not going to take advantage of the 19 and 20 year olds that you're producing at this prodigious rate, right? Where are they going to work? Who are they going to go? Are you going to put them in graduate programs and so forth? I think MIT is uniquely positioned, right, to do this. I'm particularly impressed with the fact that you've managed to come up with pretty much equal male-female percentages at MIT. That augurs very, very well for society in the future. You want to sort of focus on the use of both equality, inclusion, and you want to apply this technology very broadly. You're breaking down barriers. You're breaking down stovepipes. Please continue. Right? At the rate at which you're producing, because remember, ultimately, universities are about the quality of their students. We forget that. We talk about everything else. The rate at which you're producing your students, if you can also add some form of entrepreneurial incentive, some kind of entrepreneurial training, or some kind of mentorship, however mm -hmm. makes sense in your culture, I think you can turn Cambridge into a genuine AI center. Cambridge is today this extraordinary biomedicine um, center. Right? Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of the Broad Institute. And, and the quality of the people, and the quality of the work, and the quality of their education, and, the, and you know, it's just overwhelming. That should be your goal for these activities. Right? What's it going to take? Buildings, plans, venture capitalists. You can get it all because of the quality of your students. We are, I see that the clock is ticking uh, towards zero. I have one, let me ask you one more question, and I'm going to just uh, uh, ask you for party remarks. So, uh, how do we, another piece of advice for us, how do we all best engage at a moment when public faith in both higher education and technology is eroding? So there's the optimist and the pessimist, right? So I'm an optimist. And I think that the current uh, crazy political stuff is essentially a transitional period. And that sort of proper, proper serious people who can deal with ambiguity will emerge after this sort of strange political period we're in. Um, there's evidence that I'm right, but there's evidence that I could be wrong, right? There are parts of our history, I'm thinking of the McCarthy period, where it kind of went a little loopy. And I think it's very important that people who understand the seriousness of what we're doing, that can deal with ambiguity, understand that there's not simple answers to hard questions, speak out. Um, I think to the degree that companies like Google and Alphabet are part of the solution, we should do that. If we're part of the problem, we should stop. Um, I think the industry bears some, some, um, some blame in this because the industry as a whole has some incentives to spread misinformation, mm -hmm. et cetera. We can talk about that separately. Um, but I think people in the industry, and certainly we, recognize that this is not good for society, and we're working hard on it. Well, that's a preface for my last question. We only have a, a minute, uh, Eric. Um, you see us embarking in this, this, this adventure. I mean, we have always had work on AI here. We have always had work on machine learning at different levels. Now we're trying to make it uh, much more system-wise, so to speak. Do you have any words of advice of how to do it right, how not to do it? Uh, you know, what, what can you tell us as we embark in this, in this adventure? So when, when I talk to uh, countries, I say to them, how long does it take to start a company in your country? <laughs> right? The answer needs to be one day. And they always they give me this look like, oh my god because you know, there's this bureaucrat and this rule and so forth and so on. I think you need to have an attitude that everything that's clever needs to be startable in one day and that you'll tolerate that rate of start and failure. 
because it is through that um, essentially combinatoric innovation that the pieces to solve some of the greatest problems in science, uh, whether they're again in material science and in medicine and so forth or in computer science, if you look, all the projects I've seen so far at MIT are essentially collections of these kinds of things. They've been cobbled together because that's how it works. So the quicker and the faster you can build that system, the better. Right? You have a lot of things going for you. You've got physical location. You've got tight physical connectivity. You've got among the best students in the world, if not the best students of the world. Um, you have all the right incentives. And you should be able to market this, this sort of notion of rapid innovation, this rapid, hey, I have an idea, boom. right? That's how you want to run, run the institution, if you can, in this age of intelligence. You can, you can see why, why I say that we are extremely fortunate to have someone like Eric helping us. Please join me in thanking him for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.